Hello, my name is Margaret Ajibode. I'm the STEM Positive Disruptor. And today I have with me the um, Chief Executive of Engineering UK, Hilary Levers. Now, the reason why we have this podcast is basically we want to educate, demystify, change people's perception and raise awareness about the STEM, about STEM in general. So that's science, technology, engineering and mathematics. It's about making it more inclusive, and accessible as well. But also most importantly is to bring the, the um, public into our domain because sometimes there's lots of big question marks concerning what we do. So today um, I'm so excited about what we're gonna have a conversation about. So with, without further ado, I'm gonna bring in um, Hillary. So the, the reason why I, I wanted Hillary to be on this thing is because, uh, on this is because Engineering UK's intention is to inspire tomorrow's engineers. And for them to do that, we need to be able to understand that how we can get more young people to come into the environment and to um, STEM, to do STEM um, subjects, but also hopefully go into the profession as well. But one of the things that we have noticed is that although they go through the process of some, some people enjoy these subjects, but they still struggle. Some people go into the profession and decide they don't want to do it anymore. And also there was an article in the, in the Telegraph um, in April, which uh, states, how can we fill the skills shortage deficit that has been a conversation for um that's me for many years and so they say it is a truth universally acknowledged that the uk is facing a technical skills shortage and according to the uk commission for employment and skills 43 percent of stem vacancies are hard to fill and they said this is mainly down to a shortage of applicants with the required skills and experience and then they go on and say it is it continued that the core root of this growing skill age gap is education from school through to university and workplace training so um Hillary um I, I do because one of the things that we do what engineering do very well is have this big bang um, competition but also the aim of this is um inspire tomorrow's engineers could you can you tell us how, what can we do? Because this is a big thing. We've talked about so many years. It's something that it seems to be like a broken record we, and we don't change that record. So what would you advise? What would you like us to do? How can we change that narrative? Yeah, thank you um, for inviting me on and for that really um, helpful introduction, Margaret. Um, so Engineering UK is all about not just inspiring tomorrow's engineers, but bringing more young people from all backgrounds into the engineering and tech workforce. And, and we want them not just to get excited, but to see themselves progressing into those roles and making the choices that will enable them to do so. And you talked a little bit about, um, you know, the, the, the problem being within the education system. And I think there are some options and um, some issues with the options and opportunities within the education system. But we also see uh, that there is an information issue, a careers, understanding and information issues. So even if young people are in an environment where they have access to all the careers that would form the bedrock, of an um, of the education options and teaching that would form the bedrock of engineering and tech careers, they may not understand what those careers are, or they may not be presented in a way that is appealing to them or inclusive of them. And so it, there's a careers information issue alongside any educational issues. And uh, what we're trying to do is really make sure that all young people uh, equipped with a really good understanding of the breadth and value and really incredibly exciting opportunities of the careers available in engineering and tech and understand what they would need to do, the choices that they would need to make to be able to progress into them. That's the role of Engineering UK. And um, it's great that your podcast here, you're, you're talking about Disruptor because I think one of the critical things we need to do is disrupt misconceptions about engineering and also who might be an engineer. And, and that's where it is hard. And I know we've been having this conversation for a long time. Actually, a cultural shift in perceptions, which is mm -hmm. what we need to achieve, is, a, is something that is very hard. And to make sure people um, understand not just what the modern scope for careers are, 
but um, get rid of the outdated stereotypes about who could join those careers. Thank you. This actually is it, very interesting because, you know, you talked about a quarter of shift. So um, it's just, we know that. But actually, do we know that? Because we've talked about it, but we're not, there don't seem to be that shift or people thinking in a different way or seeing the opportunities that are available. So what would you, I mean, because I know what Engineering UK is trying to do. So because it's quite a big thing, it's very important as well, because there is an end result or there's a knock-off effect where we're complaining about the skill shortage. Yeah. So what, how do we change people's mindset? Because it's about changing people's mindset and the, the, the world of our UK and within the UK. So what would you advise is a way to do that? Because, you know, there must be options or or get people to start thinking about it anyway. Yeah, well, this is where, so we share an awful lot of information um, in very engaging ways with young people about engineering careers. Mm -hmm. So for example, we in June, 2022, held a three day event at the NEC in Birmingham, had over 20,000 young people there and they all got to see and get hands on with um, engineering and tech as well as other STEM careers. Um, they, they weren't just being told about all the career opportunities, but they were speaking to people who were already in that workforce. And a lot of the organisations who came along to that fair brought um, particularly the younger members of their workforce, um, often apprentices or people who were recent graduates, so that they were really relatable role models. And they made a real effort to bring role models who were from all different sorts of backgrounds, because mm -hmm. actually learning about a career that you find is exciting and, and really seeing for real that people like you are in those roles right. can be a very powerful experience. And we know that these career fairs, um, these types of experiences and encounters and conversations make a difference. You can see it in the evaluations that we do and the surveys of when young people tell us what they've learned and how it's affected their likely career choices. And then you can also see it more at a population level. And, you know, some of the analysis we've done has shown that young people who've been to those sorts of events and there are events that often whole classes or whole year groups are taken to are three and a half times more likely to know what uh, know about engineering careers and similarly more likely to actually say they are likely to move into those areas. So it, it is about really sharing um, insight and making it very clear as well. I think that young people are welcome. You can do that through the use of role models. But actually, I will often just be very explicit and say the reason why Engineering UK is able to do the work it does is because we represent a sector that is so eager <laughs> to bring more young people into it. And they are particularly concerned to improve the diversity of their workforce. They, they, they really support the efforts that Engineering UK is making to do that. And they're really sincere. So when you hear... Oh, don't be put off by your um, ideas of who might be engineering, doing engineering. And don't look at a workforce that was recruited 20 years ago and think that's the workforce. Actually, listen and, and trust those organisations. They really value and want a range of people to be joining them. Indeed. That's so true. But, you know, can we go back slightly? You talked about the education options. Can yeah. you um, expand on that? Can you give us more information on that? Because, again, you know, within the education system, there's one route normally that people are aware of. I know there are other options like apprenticeship or trade schools or in-house in training, but there seem to be not, it's not so clear to young people when they're going through it. And when parents or guardians or people in the public are thinking, okay, what do I want to do? Normally they go with what they know everybody else is doing rather than what's available to them or what options they think that are that are, they're not aware that are available to them. So can you please expand on that as to what are the options available to young people? Yeah, and um, I hate 
repeating stereotypes, but I am going to. So I think that most people would think, oh, if you want to be an engineer, you've got to be really good at maths and physics. And maybe you'll take them at A-level, maybe you'll go and study engineering at university. You might have a particular disciplinary area of, of engineering, like mechanical engineering or civil engineering, and then you will go and work for an organisation that, that needs those engineers. Um, whereas, in fact, the, the range of pathways in are much, much wider than that. And if you're even if you're just interested in the idea of what engineers do and the problems that they solve, even if you aren't particularly strong in maths and physics, there are still many routes in. You could take a different angle and contribute to those and um, that problem solving in a different way. Mm -hmm. So um, maths and physics are bedrock subjects. There's no doubt about it, but there are many other routes in. Um, when I was talking about the education options and opportunities, actually, it is making sure that young people have uh, in schools with really good teachers in those subjects. And there's a lot of recruitment challenges, lots of teaching shortages, which I think then escalate into the engineering shortages because actually we, we aren't able to um, give all young people the teaching by specialist teachers as they should have mm -hmm. and often there are some limitations on who schools will encourage into certain subjects and who they might for example let um, continue to study maths and physics whereas actually I would say the workforce and recruitment is a lot more open than might be perceived and you do have really powerful vocational routes alongside the A-level routes. Um, not everybody needs to take physics, not everybody even needs to take maths to come in and there are lots of engineers who come in at a later stage who realise, oh you know I went down this pathway but actually this is really interesting to me and they come in and they retrain and do it a different way or um, they might tackle a different element of engineering. There are all these different aspects. It's very interdisciplinary. So you could be working on engineering problems, which are the best problems in the world to be solving. Of course. Um, but, <laughs> but you might not um, necessarily be there with the core engineering skills, as it were. Um, the other routes, which it's so important to understand and value, are vocational pathways into engineering. And these um, are, are now being rolled into T-levels, which are currently um, being rolled out through schools. There'll be more and more coming online. And they're sort of an equivalent to A-levels. So are T-levels? Sorry, explain that. Yeah, so they, they are the vocational equivalent of A-levels. Okay. So they are normally taken post-16. Um, they're quite uh, rigorous and, and um, really a very strong qualification but they're more um, workplace oriented than A-level routes where you can really kind of study things in quite an abstract way. Mm -hmm. um, and they would include a 45 day work placement. So they're for yeah. people who, um, you know, want to be stretched, want uh, still really interested in these subjects, but actually really like thinking about them in a more implied and contextualized way. Mm -hmm. And if you take T-level pathways and there are many rolling out in engineering and manufacturing and um, in digital skills and such like, they would should enable you to progress into university or into the workplace. And it could be that you then also go on to further apprenticeships there is still apprenticeship routes as well that start at 16 but a lot of the older um vocational qualifications like btechs are starting to be phased out and replaced by the new t levels ah, interesting. Yeah, and, it's, and so actually you know it is really important that young people understand the the breadth of those routes yeah, and particularly so news about t-levels gets out there yeah. because if we saw a dip in young people taking those vocational routes for just, even just for a short time the impact on workforce needs um would be really felt and it is it is really critical. I know we've been talking for years about the shortage in this workforce, and I'm sorry, it's a conversation I wish we didn't have to have. Mm -hmm. I would love not to have Engineering UK having to work against this mission. Um, but we are genuinely very passionate about it and, and, and concerned to make sure that we have the workforce that we need, particularly around net zero. And at yes. the moment, there are some really substantive skills needs coming through. Um, for example, an estimated 26, um, sorry, 260,000 
uh, roles associated with the new grid infrastructure that will be needed or 90,000 for wind power. Um, so huge workforce needs that will be yeah. yeah, huge opportunities and in an area which young people really care about. So they're mm. passionate about the about environment. It. They may not realise, actually, if you want to make the biggest contribution, it really is adapting to and mitigating and trying to, um, you know, not just prevent, but actually uh, start to undo some of the damage done as a result of climate change. And really, it's the engineers and people with tech skills who are going to be instrumental in those areas. So true, so true. So, you know, you, you mentioned about the issue about the, the type of teachers or not the right skill set within the teaching um, environment, also about um, not the right information being sent, sent out there. So what would you say, so how can we get the industry, the education system, because really they have the, for, their, for you to teach something, you need to know what is needed in the industry itself, isn't it? Um, how can we get the, also so the education, the um, the industry, the government has to play a role as well, and even the media, how they communicate the information, because sometimes we go on the negative rather than on the positive. So what would you say we need to do? How do we put that all that together? How can they work together to ensure we don't talk about the same thing again? That's a skill <laughs> Oh, you ask so many things there. I'm going to try and uh, keep my mind on and um, track through them. The last point about the media, here's a little favour, which is actually to be using terms like engineering and engineers. And I feel that um, actually we replaced those words with things like innovation. Um, and so when we talk about we need loads of innovation to... Uh, respond to climate change and I think what career is that what would young people think oh I need to be in innovation to solve climate change I think it's actually quite a confusing message mm -hmm. and a lot of the time when people talk about innovation they they are specifically talking about engineers problem solving you know find the solutions and actually we need that innovation but we also need the people who are just actually rolling it out and doing it and okay. they might be um innovating in a very local dimension but at, they are also primarily delivering so making sure we talk about engineering and tech i see people use the word science and innovation where i'm like that's engineering it's that's that true <laughs> yes please <laughs> so there is a thing about visibility where i just yeah. think making us all more visible, really important. And then um, you talked about media representation. Actually, the Royal Academy of Engineering has been doing a lot of work on this and has a campaign um, called This Is Engineering. And some great videos that um, are just out there, very easy to find and kind of echoing around social channels with lots of boosts from um, the Academy. But they also have an image bank, which they really are encouraging media to use. So instead of just going to a stock image of engineering and what it looked like 20 years ago which which might be um three white men in hot hats building a bridge <laughs> actually here are some really contemporary images of what cutting edge engineering looks like nowadays they're incredibly Fashion. inspiring just to look at the images yeah. and really encourage media to just put that tiny bit more effort to find something that is actually a much more accurate representation of what they're talking about okay. as well as doing a bit of societal good and making sure that they're representing those careers um, okay. appropriately and um, then you talked a bit about the education so i appreciate so much all the STEM teachers who are in schools. So when I talk about teaching quality, what I actually mean is um, teachers, uh, schools that have vacancies that they are unable to fill, which is often the case in physics and maths. And so the teachers who do not have that specialism are having to teach in those areas and they can have a lot of professional development to enable them to do so, but it's much harder for them to do so and a lot of them actually don't particularly want to do that they're forced into that situation mm -hmm. so that's a, a still a massive national challenge something that dfe is very mindful of and is um trying various things to increase recruitment and retention including through financial incentives and many other means um it's 
a really hard nut to crack. So um, that's that's a, a real issue in the education system. And um, I mentioned options. We talked a little bit about options yes. and pathways. Making sure that young people don't just know about them, but they are genuinely available to them and that's in the their area. local area mm-hmm. is is a real challenge. Um, but also the careers education system as a whole. And we know the provision is quite patchy. Um, it isn't sufficiently funded. Often um, in schools, the, the the STEM careers bit is seen as extracurricular. And so the kids who know that they're interested in STEM will put their hands up and say, oh, yeah, I want to go and learn more about this or go to that talk. Whereas you can't know what you don't know, right? So actually, that's, true. that's the problem, isn't it? We work really hard to try and um, reach all young people in a class or in a year group so that the ones who are like, oh, God, I just don't get along with science, I'm not interested in it, I, I have that opportunity to go, well, it's not what I thought it was. And I thought if I cared about the planet, I wouldn't actually have a role in this area or if I was interested in ethics or if I was interested in fashion or food or all of these things where people are maybe on the surface don't see the critical engineering tech and wider STEM roles. Um, so making sure we reach everybody is really important. And we actually, we have an ask for government, which we keep repeating and I will repeat <laughs> it, that they need an additional annual investment of 40 million into the career system to really make sure that it is fit for purpose and mm-hmm. that all young people have the opportunities okay. that they should have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I also think just totally, it's ridiculous how much we spend on the education system and how much effort young people put into their education yeah. and then we we just don't put the icing on the cake we don't spend that little bit more that then enables all the other investment to ha- to um, give its full benefit mm-hmm. because if you have people going through an education system and not really understanding what the choices they are making will mean for their futures and not really thinking about their futures, and then maybe they're not ending up in something that is a really good match for them, or actually corresponds to where the jobs are and therefore where the skills needs of the nation are as well. So I just feel, oh, it's so wasteful to put so much effort in up until this point, and then not put a little bit on that really means you get the benefit. Indeed, indeed. So, um, you mentioned about the education, so thank you. Um, the industry, so in a way, so because it's about mapping as well, isn't it? it making sure, as you talk, the, the key elements now, the, the environment is quite a big issue thing, and it's about ensuring that we have the right skill set in order for us to get into the market itself. Um, you also, talk, I love the idea of the, the, the communication, the media. They have to make time to go to the right place and get the right information, not or at least relevant information for today, because I think you're, you're quite right. Sometimes they go for what we, the, the convenience. So the old art, oh yeah, this is it. This is what we know. But whereas there's much more to us now. And you also talked about the innovation that people, again, talk about innovation. Oh, isn't engineering, isn't engineers. So it's about making sure we speak the right languages where the right words are coming out. Because then if we speak the right words or make, mention the right words, it means that, the public can then start, it starts registering. Because I think if you don't know what is out there, you, it doesn't register. So yeah. for young people and for parents and guardians, then come into that place where they can make some informed decision. If they're not sure what's going on, they can't help their children. And if teachers not doing what they, but you also said that the investments required for the education and the retraining side of things. And, you know, it's, it, but something is happening. So we're not being negative. We just want to move it forward. Yeah. I can give you some positives. <laughs> you know? So I think there were some really positive indicators. So we yeah. have seen a real change in the gender representation. Mm-hmm. So um, it's you, you can look at it in two ways. So it's up 6% over the past 11 years of women in the engineering workforce. Um, it's still only 16.5%. So there's a huge way to go. But that is a positive direction of travel. And I think mm-hmm. it really, we do need to not be so frustrated that we fail to recognize the the um the 
the positive journey we've been on and actually there's much better representation at undergraduate as well and we're just about to publish some analyses looking at other um, areas of the workforce and while there is underrepresentation it isn't at the same scale anywhere near the scale of underrepresentation that there is for gender and actually everything does seem to be shifting in the right direction so from a diversity perspective I do think we are making positive inroads it does not mean we could take our eye off the ball by any stretch of the imagination but I can imagine that we could hit quite a nice virtuous circle where um, at, as you see more inclusion of a range of people in the workforce and they are more involved in the recruitment processes and in the decision making actually it becomes easier and easier to bring diversity into the workforce. So I'm 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 optimistic about that. <laughs> I also, and I and I just have to be also optimistic that I feel like if we get it right, this is a fixable issue. <laughs> so mm. I think that the messages we get to young people really land well. I think they um maybe don't naturally understand all the opportunities out there. And when they take the time to come to a careers fair or to have a conversation it's, um, with a STEM ambassador, for example, or to get more involved. You mentioned a Big Bang competition or any sort of STEM project. They often reach out to people in the workplace to support them with that. And they just start to feel that connection. They're very inspired. So this isn't an area that it's impossible to inspire people into. We just have to put the effort in, not just to reach out and do it once, but to keep that kind of continuously yes yeah I think that that's a real momentum yeah momentum isn't it yeah do you know I gosh do you know I can sit down and talk about because I think it's so important but also what I do want is people to hear you and hear what is because what you're saying is so it's nuggets that are out when we put out there it's going to be great so just finally finally just few very briefly what would be the one thing that should take away in order to, because you talked, there's so much there, but what's the one thing that you think should really be at the back of our minds where, you know, the stream for STEM or science, technology, engineering, mathematics to the world, to the public, to bring the, bring the public into our domain? What's the one thing, just one thing, doesn't have to be? Oh, <laughs> oh I'm going to cheat. That's okay. That's <laughs> but okay. it is one thing. It's I'm one thing. I'm going to say, for many organisations that care about bringing more young people into the engineering tech workforce, take a look at the Tomorrow's Engineers Code, which is a, a thing that Engineering UK manages. We didn't create it, but we're responsible for managing it on behalf of the sector. Okay. And in less than two years, we've had 220 organisations commit to working together oh, to nice. improve the coordination of all the work that they do to reach out to young people and to share their learnings for what works and what doesn't and how to be more inclusive and more thoughtful about who they're working with. And so it's one thing, that's what you could do, take a look at the code, but believe you me, if you actually then decide you want to join that community, there are many things that would flow from it that would really help those organizations make a difference. Thank you. And where, how can they access that information? It, they can look online, Tomorrow's Engineers Code, um, very easy to find and actually very easy to sign up to. All you're doing when you're signing up is pledging to work with others to improve your efforts in this area. And then there'll be a whole load of support, resources, webinars, invitations to meetings to really try and um, just work together because we are, we're all in it together. We all care about yes. the same things. Yes. You know, seriously, I can talk with you forever. But this is a wonderful, this is so one, uh, seriously, you've made my weekend now. <laughs> and it's the end of the week. But uh, yeah, so thank you so much, Hilary. I really appreciate your time and effort coming on board and just having a conversation with Mia, this conversation. So this is Step Margaret Ajibar, the STEM Positive Disruptor, with uh, Hilary Levers, of, uh, the Chief Exec of Engineering UK. Um, I really hope you enjoyed the conversation we get, we've had and use it as a, as a platform for you to start thinking in a different way because it's about changing perception, raising awareness, educating and demystifying what science, technology, engineering and mathematics, mathematics is. So thank you very much. And yes, 
Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Margaret. I've really enjoyed talking with you.